So it's time now for us to bring this home. We've had uh, 30 hours almost of conversation, and in the last minutes, we've talked about explosive rise in the growth of DG. We've talked about a potential explosive rise in the growth of storage as prices come down. We've talked about new consumer controls and interest in taking control of energy. And we've talked about new ways for consumers to participate. What we're going to do next is something we've never done at the symposium. We're going to bring the consumer to this stage and hear their views on the things that I just mentioned. To kick this off, Governor Angelina Galitova has offered to introduce this panel. Please join me in welcoming Angelina to the stage. Thank you. Thank you, Angelina. Thanks, Tom. Thank you so much. As always, it's wonderful to be here. And this is a team effort as we move forward towards achieving the goals of SB 350, the CPUC, the CEC, the ARB, and the ISO all have to work together in concert to make sure that we are aligned and that we achieve the goals as was stated before. But before we get started and looking at this room and everybody here, I have to take the opportunity since I'm the last speaker and I do have the license on behalf of the board to say thank you to the ISO, thank you for your vision, thank you for the organization, thank you Steve and thank you Tom for making sure that we have a forum where we can meet each and every year and discuss these issues which are of growing interest and concern to everybody. So join me in thanking the ISO and the wonderful staff. I, I also want to thank my fellow board members, not only Mark Ferrin, because we had such a wonderful time last night and he can't speak as a result today, but because we've had such a good collaborative effort in working together and in making sure that we do follow the policy directions that California has set up for us, that we do follow SB 350, that regionalism is an important issue for us, and that we are very careful in how we analyze these issues and all the elements that go into it. So our chair, Richard Mullen, Mark Ferron, Dave Olsen, Ash Bhagwad. It's been an honor and a pleasure to work with you and the ISO to make sure that we move forward together with our regional partners and together with our internal California partners as we achieve the goals of reducing greenhouse gas. Because if we don't work together, this won't be able to be achieved. So thank you so much for working so hard every in each day. We talked yesterday a lot about regionalism, and that's the horizontal integration, and as Governor Brown so poetically put it, coal and solar will dance together in the sunset in perfect happy harmony, and we will all work together to achieve the goal of a unified grid for the West, and may it be so. But as we move forward towards that happy ending, we also need to make sure that we have vertical integration. And that is important, and that is bringing in together all the distributed energy resources that are going to play an increasing part in the grid of the future. As uh, was mentioned before by Hawaii, this takes into account storage, energy efficiency, and making sure that we put in all of our distributed resources online and able to be integrated and provide ancillary services for the grid. It's important for the grid and the grid operators to have that visibility into the distribution grid for all of us so that we can have the signals from a DSO or a TSO be followed by an aggregated demand, which is going to be increasing. And DR is a little bit different. It's a little bit different because it's consumer driven. It's the consumer that wants it, as John Wellinghoff pointed out. A hundred rooftops every day, and that is going to include storage as well. PG&E told us that they see more than 6,000 rooftops every month coming on the grid, which creates some challenges and of course some opportunities for them as well. This is a ripple effect that we see on the ISO grid as well, that we need to manage and we need to integrate, harness, and benefit from having this abundant um, energy available to all of us. California will continue this leadership. It's not going to go away. It is consumer driven that we have the zero net energy building um, executive order that's being translated into Title 24 coming down the line as well. So residential buildings and all new construction will have to be zero net energy starting in 2020. Soon after, commercial buildings will have to be zero net energy. This is going to be something that affects the residential customers. It affects businesses. It affects policymakers in the sense that policy needs to be ready and prepared to adopt demand energy response and, demand and, and distributed energy resources to be able to be integrated into the grid. 
It's an incredible opportunity for aggregators. It's an incredible opportunity for technology providers. The internet of everything and the gadgets that are going to be able to be implemented in making sure that we can, as a consumer on our mobile devices, control our car, control our home, monetize benefits that we can provide to the grid, and all of a sudden our homes and our vehicles are going to be revenue streams, which has never happened before, and it's exciting. And it is something that consumers are paying attention to. They want to have that ability. Energy has become a topic that everybody is excited about. It is not that amorphous electron anymore. It's something that's tangible, that you can feel, and that you want to be able to control and have a part in creating. We've got to have these cutting solutions, and this is something where California is going to be taking a lead. And as Steve Berberick pointed out yesterday, the world is watching, and it's true. We have our European guests. We are very honored to be able to collaborate with them as well. It's a mutual learning process. We have people from South America looking at us and wanting to know everything that we're doing. We've got people from Asia. Everybody wants to see, will California be successful? Can we integrate 50, 60, 70% renewables and beyond? And can we simultaneously with that tackle the transportation issue? Because as everybody knows, 40% of greenhouse gas emissions are transport related. We've got to be able to figure out a way where we fit in and where the grid fits into solving that issue as well. So we've got to make sure that as we move into that brave new future, we're all ready, we have a vision, and we're brave in how we adopt that vision. And talking about fearlessness and bravery, we have a panel that's going to be addressing the issues from the ratepayer advocate perspective, from the solar energy industry perspective, from the microgrid solutions and, and, and the leadership that Susan Kennedy and her group are taking in making sure that we've got distributed energy and storage solutions available to utilities right now at a cost-effective and optimized manner is important. But please help me welcome Steve Chatham, who is the chair of California's Advanced Energy and the Economy. He is deeply involved in a transformation underway in the utility sectors, and he has always been an advocate for making sure that we've got affordable energy, that we're serving all customers, including the low-income customers, and that he fe he's fearlessly advocating for the benefits of advanced technologies in renewable energy. And just to show you how fearless he is, because I always like to have a personal touch, Steve, of all people, went to Zambia and Zimbabwe. He went to the Victoria Falls, and that's not an easy trek. I've lived in Africa, I know. But not only did he go over there and scramble around to be able to look into the falls, which is dangerous, there are no safety measures like Niagara Falls, and it's always a challenge to do. No, he took it a step further. He decided to bungee jump. He has it on video. He bungee jumped into the Victoria Falls, into the river while almost touching it, and that river is infested with flesh-eating bacteria. So. <laughs> <laughs> so, please help me welcoming the fearless and the very dedicated Steve Chadema, who is going to be ending this, uh, this symposium with one of the most exciting panels that we could possibly have hoped for. So, it's good that you stayed, and we're going to have a wonderful time. Come on, Steve. <laughs> Thanks, Angelina. The, um, as we get settled here, um, I want to reiterate some of the things that were just said. Um, we've, got, we got, uh, we've got quite a task uh, ahead of us, guys. We're, we have to bring this thing home. Uh, and I think probably um, I really applaud the, the uh, vision of the CAISO in, in having this panel. So much of what we've been talking about for the last uh, day and a half is really the kind of inner workings of the electricity system, the, the policies, the politics, the technical aspects of what goes on behind the magic curtain that for most consumers is the electricity system. Um, but it is all very mysterious to them. They really don't see nearly any of what we have been talking about for the last few days, but these folks see it every day. Uh, so we're going to have a good discussion about what these changes, what regionalization, what the, um, the uh, acceleration of distributed resources means for the average person. 
Um, and just so we're not confused, the use of consumer here, which most people think of as uh, somebody who buys a device or, uh, or uh, a car or whatever, we're talking about large industrial customers, big commercial customers, as well as individual uh, homeowners, apartment renters, uh, anyone who touches the electricity system. So each of us are going to give a brief introduction um, of ourselves or our, our organizations uh, and, uh, and then some opening comments about things that they'd like to see addressed as part of this discussion. And then we'll get into more of a roundtable type discussion. So uh, just by way of brief introduction of myself, uh, I'm with Advanced Energy Economy. We are a, uh, a collaboration of businesses that are working toward uh, really a, a robust economy based on clean, secure, affordable energy. Uh, a lot of the, the companies that are members of AWE are what you might think of as the sort of obvious suspects, the traditional suppliers of advanced energy. So the big solar and wind players, but also storage, smart grid software, demand response, energy efficiency, electric vehicles, really all of the technologies that have to work together to be able to achieve this vision. But increasingly, we have members who are also the users of advanced energy. So Apple among them, these are companies that have made big commitments to uh, renewable energy, in many cases 100% renewable energy, but policies and programs around the country, whether they be legislative or regulatory uh, barriers exist that, that stand in the way of them being able to achieve that. So our goal is to break down those barriers so that we can, uh, they as consumers can achieve uh, their objectives and, and as a system, we can also bring ourselves to that, uh, that uh, uh, zero carbon future. So um, with that in mind, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Elizabeth and she can uh, introduce herself and let you know a little bit about her perspective on these issues. Great. Well, thank you, Steve, for the introduction and thank all of you for being here. I also want to give a shout out to the CAISO, Tom, and the others who pulled this together and the Board of Governors. It's been a really fantastic conference. As you heard, my name is Elizabeth Eccles. I'm the relatively new director of the Office of Ratepayer Advocates. And I want to start by saying just a, a few words about my personal journey and why I'm so excited to be at the Office of Ratepayer Advocates, commonly known as ORA, um, at this particular time in history. But the first thing I think I need to start out with is to say that I also was at Victoria Falls in Zimbabwe many years ago, <laughs> many years ago, and had the opportunity to go whitewater rafting underneath the falls. And so I uh, <laughs> didn't get to go bungee jumping. So I didn't know about the flesh-eating bacteria. Maybe it wasn't there then, <laughs> but, but I guess I survived is the, is the important thing. Uh, I had the opportunity very early in my career to work in the Clinton White House shaping the early internet policy then later joined Google because I believed in their mission to organize the world's information and make it accessible to everyone. It was at Google where I got inspired to work on energy issues because my former boss from the White House, Al Gore, came and presented his PowerPoint, which later became the movie Inconvenient Truth. And so I was really inspired by the importance of energy policy and how to combat climate change. And so shifted my time and attention and became director of the U.S. Green Building Council for Northern California, and then more recently served as President Obama's uh, administrator for the U.S. Small Business Administration, responsible for all of the Western states, and there was able to help small businesses gain access to capital to green their businesses and also leverage opportunities in clean tech and energy efficiency. I'm really excited to be at the ORA at this time in history at where there's so much transformation going on in the energy market. Our mission at ORA is to achieve the lowest possible rates for customers consistent with safety, reliability, and the state's environmental goals. No small task. Um, we represent all of the ratepayers around the state, hundreds, well actually millions of hard working people and, and small businesses who uh, don't have time to navigate the state's complex processes. So we are their voice uh, in the commission proceedings and in other forums as well. At this time, 
where we the state is facing just very significant and exciting changes to our energy markets and how energy is produced where it's produced how it's delivered to customers it's an opportunity to rethink how the customer interacts with the grid how the customer interacts with their utility and so that's very exciting to me and at ORA our our goal is to ensure that every customer can benefit from these changes and that nobody is left behind. As an agency that, that primarily has two large customer bases, residential consumers and small business consumers, uh, we're well aware of just how different needs can be. Uh, you know, for example, a, a tech savvy young professional in San Francisco is going to have very different needs than a retired senior in the Central Valley. And similarly with a small business, the mom and pop store on the corner is going to have a very different needs than than a fast-growing startup in Silicon Valley. And so looking at this huge diversity of needs and challenges and opportunities, we are focusing on how, how do we look at the future grid and the modernization of the grid and make sure that no one is left behind. And that really is our, our goal in our day-to-day -day work. Well, thank you, Steve. Uh, and thanks to the ISO for having me here uh, this morning. I'm Sean Gallagher. I'm the... Uh, uh, VP of State Affairs for SIA, the Solar Energy Industries Association. Uh, SIA is the National Trade Association for the Solar Industry, and so I guess I'm sort of a stand-in for solar customers today, uh, on a consumer-driven uh, panel. Um, uh, my group works in about a dozen states. We work in state legislatures and state commissions and at ISOs, and our work is to make the world, or in the states in particular, safe for solar. Um, and I figured that since I'm uh, the industry guy, I should start with a few facts and figures, and, and so that's what you have on the, on the slide that you can see. Uh, in the top left, you've got quarterly residential. These are residential uh, uh, installations in the U.S. nationally. Uh, and in the top right, you've got the forecast of annual uh, residential installations out to 2021. So you can see that adoption of rooftop solar by residential customers has been really strong in the last several years, and the projections are to show that that's going to continue to increase. Uh, and the bottom left uh, is commercial industrial customers. That's been a little bit less of a smooth growth. Uh, but still there's been uh, strong adoption by CNI customers and there's a number of reasons for that. Uh, California has always been about 50% of the U.S. solar market and that continues to be true. It's now trending a little bit below 50% um, and that's expected to continue. This growth is expected to continue in California and nationally and we can say, I think earlier Chairman Bay mentioned there's about four megawatts of, or sorry, four gigawatts of, res of uh, rooftop uh, solar in California today. We report numbers in megawatts DC, so we have uh, five megawatts or five gigawatts of DC in uh, California today. About 3,000 of that, or 3,000 megawatts is residential, about 2,000 is CNI. And the numbers are continuing to grow. In 2015, uh, 1,000 megawatts of residential solar PV was installed in California. 2016 is going to be similar, and we're going to see about 500 megawatts of CNI solar, rooftop solar installed in California this year. Um, and rooftop solar is helping to reduce system peaks. Uh, ENI, EIA released data this week showing that uh, use of natural gas declined this summer, uh, and so solar is helping to uh, cut uh, demand and cut need for uh, expensive resources and expensive hours and expensive and in polluting hours. Um, so I'm going to turn now to um, something that Commissioner Randolph mentioned and that, uh, and that others have mentioned earlier today, and that's what do we do to align uh, customer behavior with system needs? And you can turn to the next slide. Um, the, um, we have all this uh, clean, uh, cheap energy, more and more of it in the middle of the day. Uh, and so there's been a lot of discussion about how we, and, and it's clear that customers want solar, right? Uh, we have polling that shows that uh, customers across the political spectrum support rooftop solar at rates of uh, around 80%. Uh, and we see that these projections are going to continue. So uh, we have to find ways to give customers what they want and not stand in the way of, of, of giving customers what they want. But we do also have to align or better align customer behavior with what the system needs. And one uh, idea, one tool that's gotten a lot of um, a lot of uh, discussion recently are time of use rates. And this discussion is happening not only in California, it's happening nationally. A key feature of the recent, a big recent settlement in Colorado had to do with time of use rates. And time varying rates are under discussion in New York and other places as well. So the, the trick then uh, should be to design rates that help, um, that work for both customers and the grid. 
and that encourage, rather than discourage, uh, continued adoption of sol both solar and other new technologies. Um, we've had time of use rates in California for a long time. Uh, many of you know this, um, and uh, some of you are probably on time of use rates, uh, as I am. Um, but in, in the past, uh, time of use rates have had high priced peak periods in the middle of the day when uh, energy was more expensive. Today, we have um, utilities proposing on peak more expensive periods for retail customers that start at four or five in the afternoon and go to nine or 10 at night. There's not a lot of solar at nine or 10 at night. Um, but um, as you can see in the top right hand side of this slide, um, while marginal capacity costs tend, are peaking later uh, in the day uh, now as, uh, as more uh, solar comes online, both on the transmission grid and on the distribution grid, marginal transmission distribution costs are still peaking earlier, uh, late in the afternoon rather than late in the evening. And so um, what does this tell us about time of use rates? What it tells us is that we have to be careful, we want to be careful, we should be careful, about incentivizing customers to use more electricity in the afternoon, um, which could have unintended consequences of increasing load just as distribution and transmission systems or distribution systems in particular are most strained. And we wanna make sure that customers can respond to price signals, uh, the price signals that we're trying to send with time of use rates. Uh, different customers, as I think Commissioner uh, Randolph mentioned and, and, uh, and uh, Elizabeth mentioned, have different needs and, and can do different things. So our approach and our recommendation to the Commission is to develop a menu approach with time of use rates that will allow differently situated customers to make their own contributions to the system needs. Uh, a menu approach also means that there's no need for drastic uh, on-peak, off-peak rate differentials. Uh, you can have rather a more of a, what we're calling a TOU light uh, approach for default rates and then hang menu uh, and options off of those uh, default rates to allow customers to respond. Critical peak pricing, for example, is a good option that allows customers who can respond at those uh, very narrow times of very high peak demand to respond. And certainly a quick look at ISO market prices in the last couple of years shows that uh, on-peak and off-peak price differentials uh, that are very high are, are probably not justified. The last thing I'll say is that um, uh, if you have a menu approach, you can enable quite a lot of different uh, things to occur. One of them is uh, on the, in the bottom right-hand corner of the slide, an idea that's been proposed by our state affiliate, affiliate Calcia, is to have uh, a rate that encourages deployment of batteries. And this one does have a very high uh, peak to off-peak differential to encourage deployment of batteries. And if you use something like this as an optional rate, it allows customers that can uh, afford batteries and that have the desire to do that to, uh, to put storage on the system and to, to to help uh, the, uh, the st provide assistance to the system, provide, and as I say, to, to support this concept of better aligning customer behavior with system needs. Well, thanks again, I look forward to the discussion, Steve. Thanks, Sean. Sam, um, you are an energy intensive customer that is also incredibly price sensitive, so um, your perspective, I think, will be really important here. Yeah, I mean, that, that's pretty much my uh, opening, so I could. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm, uh, I'm Sam Harper. I'm with Gerdau Steel. Uh, we, we melt steel uh, to make rebar. Um, and I, I guess I should start by thanking the Cal ISO simply for this uh, panel existing. I think it's a great thing that we're putting a renewed emphasis on customers. Um, you know, we've talked a lot of, about a lot of programs and technologies. Um, at the end of the day, when you boil it down, all of us are going to be paying for whatever we decide, right? So it's very important to figure out uh, how that impacts the customer and also how the customers can uh, help the grid, right, uh, through TOU rates or, or otherwise. Um, so just a little background on what an industrial customer kind of faces. Uh, we make rebar, reinforcing bar, uh, typically seismic reinforcing bar for uh, highways, bridges, uh, high rises. Our steel went into the Wilshire Grand Project in LA. Uh, we went into the Apple II campus. Uh, and we make that steel with 100% uh, recycled scrap metal. So when your car gets 20 years old, it goes to a scrap yard, it gets shredded, and comes to us. Uh, we use electricity to melt that scrap trash into uh, new, brand new steel. And the nice thing about steel is you can do that forever. You lose no chemistry infinite times. Um, so as you might imagine, melting steel with electricity takes a lot of electricity. Um, we spend millions and millions of dollars every year uh, on electricity. It's actually our number one cost of converting that raw material into new steel. Um, so we, we care quite a bit about it. Um, and the other thing about the steel industry is it's highly competitive. So it's global. 
Uh, it's a commodity driven. The margins are extremely small. In fact, uh, negative a lot of years. Um, it, and so we care a lot about the, the price of energy. Um, so it's, tip, it's hard for every steel company around the world, but it's particularly hard here in California. Um, I mean, this is public information that the, the cost for energy uh, for the industrial sector in California is about 2x that of our, our competition. So you can imagine for our, our number one cost, it's 2x the price, it makes it uh, very difficult. Um, so, so the irony in that situation is that California is currently importing uh, the vast majority of its steel, and it's coming in from other states and other countries with much higher fossil fuel content, and it's traveling hundreds of, or thousands of miles, really, uh, on diesel burning ships and trucks. All right, so the irony is that uh, steel production here is the greenest available, and uh, every time we import steel, we're actually increasing emissions. So, um, you know, I'm discussing the steel industry. It's what I know best, but we're a member of CLECA, so I know that other large energy users, uh, they, they have the same types of uh, problems, you know, oxygen, cement, glass. Um, we're importing a lot of these bulk, heavy, high GHG type uh, pro, uh, materials. So I guess the first point I want to make is uh, we certainly agree with the policy goals of California. Uh, we're certainly aligned, but we need to be very careful that uh, the intent of a policy does it have unintended consequences that could actually increase emissions in certain instances. Um, the, the next thing I wanted to talk about, which I think others have and will mention, is uh, price signals. So I think you can see, or if you could show them the, uh, the slide, that the duck curve, um, everyone's aware of that. And I just want to emphasize that there are, are probably many tools that could, could help that situation. One tool that uh, could use some more emphasis is load shifting. Um, TOU rates have a place, but I would certainly encourage uh, consideration of dynamic price signals. So uh, there, it's not true that certain hours of every single day are a problem. It's more true that typically those hours are a problem. Some days it's a, a really big problem, and some days it's not. So the more you can send real price signals uh, through the, the wholesale market or a proxy, uh, the more you'll get the right response at the right time. Uh, and the other nice thing about that is that you don't need to go through a several year process to come up with which hours are which, um, and then find out that you were wrong two or three years later. You're right, you can have a, a natural way to, to shift when loads uh, respond. So I think one example of this, if you go to the next slide, um, so the Ontario uh, system, Ontario Canada, has uh, very strong price signals. Uh, most are related to the five system coincident peaks, um, but they have a, a number of other programs related to TOU and more formal uh, demand response programs. And so I, I've selected three days uh, from August. The, the blue line is a kind of a typical normal curve for that system. Um, no response at all. Uh, the top two lines were, were system peaks, and you can see that the ramp is, is pr fairly steep, and then uh, many customers of all types uh, realize that that signal is coming, they curtail, and you get an extremely flat load for several hours across their system peak. And so I would imagine if I were a grid operator with Cal ISO, I would be just, uh, I would trade for that load profile any, any day, right? Um, so the idea is, uh, Price signals can dramatically help uh, overgen, duck curve, steep ramp, um, and embracing that would be really good for the system. Um, and, and then I'll just finish with the last point that, you know, it's good for reliability, um, but also as you shift power from the, the peak to the off-peak, you're going from high uh, heat rate to low heat rate. So you're helping emissions as well, uh, and you're avoiding the most expensive resources, so you should be lowering overall costs for everybody. Thanks. Susan, I think Angelina teased us with the uh, brief description of your cutting edge uh, technology integrating the customer side with the grid. I, I think people would love to hear more about that. Well, thank you. Um, my name is Susan Kennedy, and I, uh, I am the founder and CEO of a company called Advanced Microgrid Solutions. We are a development company. We develop, uh, we design, build, and manage energy store, energy management projects behind the customer's meter at commercial industrial facilities using en advanced energy storage as the load control technology. Um, and it's, 
it's, a, it's an important distinction that we are a, a project development company, not a technology company. Uh, because it, 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 in our view, we, the solutions that are required in order to uh, balance the grid today require a whole different set of technologies than currently exist. And energy storage represents a, a fundamentally uh, um, game-changing load control technology that, when applied properly, can actually provide the, the, the kind of value and the kind of services that uh, solve a myriad problems uh, all in, in one integrated system. And so we're using technologies to, we're using advanced energy storage at very, at, at, at behind the customer's meter at very large industrial loads. And we're designing these projects as a utility facing solution. Customers don't want technology. They're, if you can throw up my first slide, I'll explain uh, this in a picture. Now, some of you have seen this slide. If you look at the red line, that's a customer with solar. So they, you see the customer's load profile uh, as the solar comes online, begins to go down, and they, and they start net metering in the middle of the day. So when the red line hits below zero, that customer is net metering their solar. And then at the end of the day, when the sun stops shining, their load shoots back to the grid, their demand shoots back to the grid. And this is what's causing the, the neck of the duck. That customer is following price signals. They're following all of the regulatory policies that we as, as uh, policymakers have put in place over the years because we, we told everyone, we want you to uh, put solar on your roof. We, put, we set tax benefits in place through the ITC, net energy metering policies, feed-in tariffs, uh, subsidies for distributed generation. We said, put solar on your roof. And that, that customer believes, and, they got, and they're getting the benefit of that. And they believe that for every, they're, they're, they're reducing carbon and they're participating in part of the solution. Come back, uh, put that slide back up, please. Keep that there for me. So, the, you know, this customer is now uh, facing what, what they're, what they're not really aware of is that blue line is the distribution system. And that's what the grid operator and the utilities are having to plan for. So they have to have uh, uh, peaker plants on spinning reserve and resources on spinning reserve for that customer's load to come back to the grid. And so that customer is now is paying for this twice. First, it's a very, when the system peak moves later in the day, they're now paying not only for their very, very expensive electricity as the time of use changes towards the end of the day, but they're also going to pay for the infrastructure investment uh, that the utilities and the grid operators have to make in order to have a secondary system on reserve for them. So they're paying for it twice. And so we sell, we, we actually go down and deal with these very large customers on a, on a regular basis. And you're, and as the time of, got to keep that slide up there for me. I'm going to come grab that thing from you. <laughs> Do not move that slide, whoever you are. <laughs> Utilities are going to spend a hundred billion dollars on the, on the net, on the distribution system alone in the next, a hundred billion dollars a year over the course of the next decade. And so customers are now facing uh, time of use rates that are shifting and, and uh, with, with a lot, with their, their, their providers are telling them that you know, they're, they're actually causing part of the problem by putting solar on their roof and, and, and uh, net metering. And so they're gonna, they're gonna be paying for this twice. And, and every customer that's put, a sol put solar on their roof is now, they're frustrated and they're, and they're skeptical. Uh, because we sold them technology. We told them, put solar on your roof. And now we're telling them that we're going to shift, that the system peak is happening later in the day, and now you need another technology. Now you need to do something else because we need you to pay because you're actually causing a problem on the grid. So go to my next slide. Oh, I'm sorry. So that, that green line at the bottom is that same customer with storage. And so harnessing the customer's load with storage it, uh, does two things. First of all, it, it actually lowers the cost to the customer, even if with even with net metering uh, rates as they are, they actually save more money by curtailing their load instead of it shooting back to the grid than uh, than paying for that very expensive electricity. But more importantly, it's the holy grail for distribution planning because if, when that customer has has storage with their solar, it it becomes an empirical load management tool that the distribution operator can see. You, you, app, you know what that customer's load's going to be because it is, it is controlled by the, by the storage. And as long as that information is visible to the distribution operator, they can now plan that system around uh, what that load is going to be. 
So it is, an, it, it is the keystone technology in order for, for distribution planning. If you could now go to the next slide for me. Mm. It. Okay, so financing storage. Storage is a very expensive piece of equipment, and nobody wants batteries. Nobody wants batteries. They want savings. They want reliability. They want carbon reduction. They want the products, the energy products, that come from energy storage. But how do you pay for it? Where, do you, where is the customer incentive? So you know, where, if you're, there's four ways in which you, there's four quadrants basically in which you can, you create value putting, putting storage behind a, 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 a customer's load. There's either utility service, there's market products and ancillary services, frequency regulation, uh, load following products. And then on the customer side of the meter, there's demand management. That's not just demand charge management, but you know, rate arbitrage, but it's actually curtailing the customer's load and controlling their, their demand. And then there's energy efficiency. If you put the right technology with, demand, with, a, with battery storage, you actually have a very state-of-the-art, cutting-edge, continuous monitoring system for demand management. So there's value created in each of these four quadrants. Problem is that the market rules and the, and the, the revenue streams to pay for these are, are very different and the utilities don't agree with the, with the, uh, with the CAISO and, or the, the grid operators in terms of what a market product is, what the price is, how it should be settled, how you measure it. And so customers, in terms of their ability to participate in being part of the solution, they, are gonna, they have to wait for the price signals to be sent and the market rule signals to be sent from regulators that can't necessarily agree on even what the market product is. So what, what's happening today is what the thing that we need to understand is that you're dealing with one customer's load, whether you put solar, whether you put batteries, whether you have distributed generation, you know, co-gen, whatever, backup generation, whatever you have at the customer's site, you're dealing with one customer's load. So when you, we have to stop thinking of this in terms of selling customers technologies and encouraging them to put in technologies. We have to think of it holistically as regulators in order to be able to send the right signals, market signals in terms of what we want that customer to do with their load and let the technologies that can, solve, that can participate in being that, that solution, uh, you know, the, the cost effectiveness of those technologies We'll, we'll be able to, they're in the market already. We can, we can apply them in the market through the price signals, but we have to stop selling consumers technologies and start synchronizing the price signals with uh, what we want the customer's load to do. Thanks, Susan. For those of you who are not familiar with her background, not only was she a public utilities commissioner here in California, but she was chief of staff to Governor Schwarzenegger, so you don't mess with Susan. <laughs> this was not, remember that, guys. So, uh, Actually, to solve that problem, we've actually given Mike the clicker, so he can actually control his own his own show over here. But uh, but uh, Mike uh, Pelos from Apple, uh, always on the cutting edge as a consumer of of energy, and uh, you know I, there's endless stories. So I guess I'll let Mike tell them rather than me. Thanks, Steve. Um, what I thought might be useful if we talk about uh, today is is Apple's journey to 100% renewable worldwide. What we've learned from that. And then in particular focus on um, our uh, efforts back in California on the new campus and uh, how it uh, deals with the issue of grid integration and specifically as a microgrid uh, with, that's dispatchable with, that is also 100% renewable uh, solution. So let me first talk about some, our journey to 100% renewables. Um, let me say that we find it useful as we meet our own goal that we can also demonstrate to decision makers and government agencies that this can be done without the world falling apart. And what's interesting is, in every state, we have a different regulatory model. In every country we operate in, it's a different regulatory model, yet we found it's possible to do. Let me just share a, quick, a few quick examples. Our, our first uh, entry into this field was really our, our data center in Maiden, North Carolina. Uh, we actually did a, a PURPA QF qualified facility uh, right adjacent to the 13-acre data center. We put a 100-acre solar farm. We've actually tripled that now and have 10 megawatts of uh, fuel cells uh, supplied by directed biogas, meeting the energy needs uh, there in North Carolina in the regulatory model that was appropriate for that state. In, in Nevada, we had a totally different structure, and we, we chose to partner with the utility uh, in a way that we designed, financed, and built a new type of technology appropriate for the desert uh, sunlight there. Uh, and it's an interesting regulatory approach in that we designed and built it. The utility operated it from day one and can integrate it into their, uh, their generation fleet in the long term. So we create additionality, but let the utility do what they like to do best. 
Um, in Oregon, we have both uh, direct access wholesale markets and uh, PERPA QFs. Uh, we've done wind and solar, and here's a picture of um, uh, some, some uh, micro, the, the, the river that feeds some of our micro hydro plants. So we're using hydro in a way that doesn't create any new impoundments. We're actually capturing the energy from water flowing through irrigation canals that have no fish in them. There's no impoundment, no valley flooded, uh, but we're producing power there. Uh, and we have a couple models that, that are helpful there. In um, Arizona, uh, there's, there really wasn't really much in the way of consumers being able to green their loads. So we worked directly with the utility SRP to, to, to uh, create a new solar plant that will supply the energy needs of our data center there. Um, so where does, this, where does this leave us? At least in the United States, as of January 2013, we are 100% renewable in the United States, meaning that all of the energy we consume, we, we create um, an offsetting amount of, of uh, renewables in the same grid region in which we operate. We also have work overseas. Let me talk about that. So um, uh, first, one of our first efforts was, it was in Sichuan, China, which is near the city of Chengdu. If you've ever been to Chengdu, you actually cannot usually see the sun because the pollution is so thick. So this is on the plateau above the city. And we sized two 20 megawatt solar plants to meet all the needs of our commercial and uh, retail facilities in China, using this, uh, working with state grid and using the national policy there. In Singapore, we were told there really isn't room for 100-acre solar farms. It's a very dense urban environment. So we work with Singapore Power to um, utilize our rights on, under the contestable load, contest the fossil fuel generation, and provide our own generation through hundreds of rooftops on adjacent buildings, uh, working with the housing authority. We put solar, uh, distributed solar, uh, to meet our, our, our grid generation needs. You'll see a combination of behind the meter and, uh, and grid solutions and combinations of the two. I'll also say that we have uh, over 500 retail stores around the world that are using various forms of utility or purchased energy uh, that are renewable now. Um, and we're actually challenging our suppliers uh, to follow suit. Uh, and we've, we've gotten several suppliers that are now committed. We're asking all of them to do so. Uh, and we're asking them to, uh, to, to do this as well. Globally, just for Apple's footprint, we are now actually at 93%. Uh, every year we update this number and it tells us what work we have to do. Uh, we have a lot of work to do overseas, but it's not just getting from 93 to 100, it's actually maintaining 93 because as we delight our customers, we have huge load growth. So staying at 93 is actually harder than going from 93 to 100. And we're, we're talking about uh, what we'll need to do uh, to, as this gets larger over time. Let me shift gears now and talk about our new campus. Now I like to say when I see this picture, someone spoke earlier about the zero net energy goal for California in 2020 and 2025. Our new campus is a giant zero. Um, <laughs> and it, in fact, is a zero net energy. But the important story here is it not just another 100% renewable story. It is a dispatchable microgrid. So let me talk about our thought process for this. So the first thing we did, I, if you remember the old televisions, you used to have a coarse tuning knob and a fine tuning knob. The first approach was to create some correspondence between the load profile and the um, uh, generation profile on site and off site. So the, the top graphic there is the summer generation and consumption. The bottom is the winter. The light green is the fuel cells, which supply our base load um, uh, steady throughout out the year. We size those for the winter solstice weekend. Um, and then we said, OK, let's look at the solar. And we actually have 16 megawatts DC uh, on-site solar between the building and the, and the parking structures. And the dark green is that output, more in the summer, less in the winter, as the building uses more or less. And that meets most of our energy load. The remainder actually is the blue coming from an off-site solar plant through direct access. So we have a little bit of, of, of each thing. But what's most interesting is that it's tied together uh, in a microgrid. So let's look under the hood and see what's, what that's composed of. Uh, our microgrid has these fuel cells. It has the on-site solar. It's, it's accommodating the, the, the off-site solar. But we also have the building to dispatch the, the building the, through load response. And we have 400 on-site uh, employee car charging stations, which also can be modulated. And we have a, a storage battery. So we, we really like the idea that this is uh, a two-way communications over in, the, in the, the grid, which is a network. We just don't have watts flowing. We also have bits and bytes of information flowing. And it's not just from the utility to the load. It's a two-way conversation. Um, on, on the uh, right part of the slide, you see that our grid-connected um, solar project. I think Tom Steyer mentioned this yesterday. This is uh, our California Flats project uh, coming online that will serve our meters in California through direct access for this campus and others. And, and as expected, it would have a day ahead uh, coordinator, a schedule coordinator that will check in with Cal ISO and give a day ahead prediction as to what's coming to the bus bar there. But our campus will have a schedule coordinator as well. We're going to look at the net between the projected building 
energy consumption the next day based on the weather patterns and the heating and cooling loads and the generation profiles and report the net of that and uh, put, put that into the grid. And so we'll have a schedule coordinator both for the campus and for the remote microgrid, and these two will work together. So we really think it's a model of not just renewable, but if, you, if, you're, if we're successful in getting to greater uh, renewable penetration, we need to deal with intermittency and dispatchability, and, and we think it's a, a step forward in, in that area. And I'd like to say this isn't just a pie chart or, or, or a pie in the sky or uh, some kind of futuristic vision. This is a campus under construction as we speak. We plan to move in in 2017. Let me say that what, the way we're going to move in will be acceptable. Um, but it won't be optimal. And we really think there's some regulatory challenges to overcome to make it more optimal, which really means that many others could do this as well. And, and we're really working hard to, uh, to address some of those regulatory issues uh, to make it more optimal for, for others to be able to do this as well. But it's, it's a, it's a real-life project. We actually cannot move in unless we um, have the microgrid in operation because it's a condition of approval under AB 900. We promised that we would do, be 100% renewable. And the Air Board asked us to address how we're going to deal with intermittency. And we said, okay. We hadn't told you, but we plan a microgrid, and that, that, that aspirational goal then became a regulatory requirement. So we have to do this uh, to be able to move in. So we, we want to make this work. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. And that actually um, leads to a good first question for everyone here. Um, you mentioned that there are some regulatory hurdles to becoming uh, fully operational as a campus. Um, at every level, I think, uh, particularly for businesses, both the suppliers of electricity, but also for Susan's customers and others, uh, Sam, maybe you as well, there are, there are better regulatory environments and there are not so great regulatory environments to operate in. Um, we've got a lot of regulators in the room, both from California regulatory agencies as well as from out of state. What are the things that can be changed from a regulatory perspective that would make it much easier for you to be able to move your technologies forward and to achieve, in particular, some of your renewable energy goals? You can start, Mike, but anybody, please answer that Steve, question. Steve, let me, let, me give you, uh, let me give you my top three. Um, uh, the first really is really removing the obstacles and dealing with the details for distributed storage. I'll come back to that in a moment. Secondly is to removing the obstacles to voluntary renewables participation. And thirdly, a follow-on to that is to recognize that you know, maybe the utility RPS is no longer the only game in town in terms of statewide uh, renewables uh, achievement. There's direct access customers like ourselves who are doing renewables, a growing number of CCAs. And the RPS not only doesn't capture that, it actually competes with it and makes life harder for those guys. So let me talk about each one of those. So for the microgrid, everything that, that Susan talked about is, is great. We need to do that. but it, the regulations evolve for a completely different set of, of objectives than we have now. And they're, they're pre frankly not very helpful. The first step is to interconnect. We've seen that be difficult. It's increasingly difficult now that utilities want to participate in the uh, storage market. And maybe there's a conflict of interest to have a, a barrier to others entering the market that they want to participate in now. It's very difficult. We found that even though we're doing something to ease grid impact, we were asked to pay additional fees for, um, because, we, because we wanted to use a, a, a microgrid. Um, I, I, John Wellinghoff spoke articulately about um, one aspect we think is important, which is it's not just the size of the storage, but the speed. And I would say what we're doing initially, which is to do net energy meeting with proxy demand response, regulators will know what that is, is great, but it's kind of like taking the winner of the Kentucky Derby and putting, him, putting that, that thoroughbred into a pony ride. We're going to use proxy demand response, which is like, OK, we can shed some load this afternoon. That's fine. But we have 15-minute peaker plants. We have eight-minute peaker plants. I got a six-second microgrid, six-microsecond microgrid. That's a fast resource. We're not fully recognizing that. And in fact, the WDAT tariff would do that, but it's a wholesale tariff for a retail customer. We say we want distribution, or we want storage in the distribution network, but a distribution customer, by definition, is a retail customer, so it's difficult to combine the wholesale and retail. So we're trying to do proxy demand response as a way to start. We think the real solution would be to add ancillary services, specifically frequency regulation. You can certainly shift load from day to night, and that's good. But the speed of, of the current battery technology is what's most valuable to the grid. We can beat the pants off of peakers. And, and there's no way to, to really acknowledge that. Those signals should be able to be put in there. In terms of voluntary participation, it's not easy. And California is one of the easiest places. The, um, the departure fee, the PCIA, is we think something that's really a burden shift. And I think when we talk about protecting rate payers, an increasing part of the rate base is uh, direct access customers like ourselves and CCAs. We think that the transition charge of the PCA 
needs to be addressed in some way. But for us, you saw the, the building under construction. This isn't a departing load. It's never arrived. We've never been served by PG&E and never will for purposes of generation. We will be a, gen we will be a T and d customer for PG&E, but they'll never provide generation. And we told them that the moment we requested service. So we shouldn't have to pay departing load fees. And if we do, then it should be finite, a finite duration. In Oregon, for example, we, we paid an upfront fee and then it transitions out over time. Uh, right now we have to pay an indefinite fee forever and it's hefty. And that's a burden for um, wholesale customers like making steel. It, it's a couple cents a kilowatt hour and, and growing. It's a real obstacle and really a burden just for those that are choosing to do those more, more creative options. And we think that's something that should, should be looked at. Frankly, it looks like the IRP actually can, considers departing load as part of the future load growth. So it's not that much of a surprise. Maybe it should only be the delta between the projection of departing load and the IRP and the actual. Uh, and if load growth eventually subsumes uh, those that depart, uh, so, so be it, then that, that, load, that, that charge should, should phase out. So, so we think those are, those are some obstacles that could be removed. And then lastly, it's kind of a notional idea that maybe the RPS is no longer the only game in town. When we talk about California's goals, we talk about the RPS as if that's the only thing there is. But an increasing number of uh, California customers are participating in CCAs in California and across the world, direct access renewables, and there's no way to count, the, count those, and in fact, they're hindered as, as RPS uh, goes to higher numbers like 50%. That's creating grid conjection that then makes our economics be much more uncertain. So what if there are a way that we said California's goal is 50%, we want to go higher? Maybe that's not just moving the RPS to 55 or maybe it's adding a new category of voluntary activity that is governed by some, some, some structure and has some incentive. And the state's goal would be a combination of utility RPS and voluntary activities that are encouraged and have a formal status. We're very big on accountability. We use the same structures in reporting our renewable compliance as PG&E or Duke Energy on the East Coast. And so we, we have rigor in our, our reporting and, and would be very amenable to a, a structure that counted voluntary activities as part of the overall state's goal. Climate change is a big problem. Uh, maybe we need more than just the utilities uh, uh, participating in this. And we certainly see that movement. Maybe it's time to acknowledge that. Susan, I'm sure you've got some perspective on this. So. I agree with, with, with everything you just said. I would say that from a customer's perspective, synchronizing the, um, the, the rate design with the technology incentives that customers that are being given to put in te distributed technologies with wholesale market opportunities um, would be the, the, the key thing. Because right now, there are three very distinct uh, programs and the economics of installing technologies to be part of the solution don't work. I mean, if, you, if you're incentivized to put on one technology on your on-site that has a certain function, but your rate design is that, uh, actually uh, disincentivizes you to use that technology during the day. And that, that's actually embedded in today's, uh, today's world. You've got certain, you've got big customers that are on rates that are actually incentivizing them to increase their load during mi mid-peak and peak. At the same time, you're, you're, you're giving them funds to put in technologies that will reduce their load during parts of the day when the system peak is going to occur six hours later. Literally, you're spending billions of dollars incentivizing customers to put in technologies we don't want them to use. And so we have to synchronize the rate design with the, uh, the technology incentives and then creating a market opportunity for customers to be participating in the distribution level benefits. If we're, if we're selling technology to customers that they can only really value on the customer side of the meter, it'll never pay for itself. It doesn't pay for itself to put these technologies in if it's only in demand management. The, the real opportunity is to participate at the wholesale level and at the, uh, at the distribution level and be part of the solution. That's how you make the economics work. So Sam, you were talking earlier about dynamic pricing, and I think that's sort of every economist's dream, is to be able to super optimize everything with all these micro changes. Um, and yet, Elizabeth, you and I were talking earlier that the average consumer probably doesn't want to deal with dynamic pricing as they're looking at their air conditioning, turning on or off, or you know, do I do the dryer now or not? Um, so how do you reconcile these vast differences in the ability of consumers, at very large consumers, and the retiree in Fresno that you mentioned earlier in your opening remarks. How do you reconcile the two completely different consumer experiences with the kinds of programs and rates that, um, that these consumers uh, can face? 
So first of all, a, a recognition that one size doesn't fit all, and I think we all understand that here in this room. So maybe dynamic pricing will work for some of the larger consumers, but it's not going to work for most individual retail customers. For a retail customer spends less than 10 minutes a year thinking about their energy bill. So for them to engage in something like dynamic pricing, that's just not really on the table for most uh, most retail customers. Um, but it is important to send price signals to the consumers, and it is also important that the, the technologies and the policies and the incentives line up in a way so that consumers who want to participate and who want to put solar on their roof, who want to put a battery storage, that, that all of that fits together in a way that they can be part of the solution. Stephen, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I think um, Elizabeth is, is exactly right. I mean, what we have to do is design rates that customers can respond to, and that's going to be different for differently situated customers. So for uh, rooftop solar, um, your question about regulation, what we really need to do is not uh, pose new obstacles. We've, we put a, we've spent a lot of time, as, uh, as speakers on the last panel uh, mentioned, uh, incentivizing customers to put solar on the rooftops. And we don't want to make an abrupt U-turn uh, and, uh, and, and strand those customers' investments. So for one thing, we have to have uh, grandfathering for customers to protect the investments that they've made uh, so that they, and customers who have uh, uh, sort of made investments on their, with their own money uh, for their own uh, homes or businesses, don't lose the value of that. If we've seen in Nevada, that's a, it's a, that's a no-no. Uh, and as we go forward, we have to be careful to continue to protect customers' investments. And then, you know, we've sort of seemed to have entered a stage here in California where at some level we, we're, starting to, we're starting to be, be careful what we ask for. Uh, and I think we can find that we can um, continue to increase uh, deployment of solar and to satisfy customers desires for solar and also better align those customers behavior with the grids with smart rate designs that enable the customers who can respond to respond but don't penalize customers who can't respond uh, by by too much and that's why we suggest this sort of a, a, a time varying rate that's not very steep as the default and then uh, options for customers who can do more yeah if I could add on to that I think uh, that one key point is uh, make it optional, especially for the small consumers. Uh, but even for the industrial uh, consumers, most industrial consumers uh, do not see wholesale rates, and they cannot see wholesale rates even if they want to. If they haven't gone to DA, they essentially can't see wholesale rates. Uh, even rates that appear to be something like that, like RTP, is a proxy that is lacking in many ways. Um, so I'd say for the industrial guys, um, force them to do it, right? Or at least provide options. And for the, the residential folks or small commercial, provide the option, because you're right, uh, many people don't pay much attention, but many people, some significant uh, percentage might pay more attention if there was free energy during some period, or you know, if there's some big reason to do this, they, they might pay attention, which, and there hasn't been that reason to pay attention thus far. And we see residential programs around the country, even in unlikely places, uh, Oklahoma comes to mind that has a residential program that's optional. They provide, uh, 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 in the first year, you, you can't lose if, if you, know, you, you, you opt in and it doesn't work out, you're, you're even. Uh, but they get tons of response, uh, even from the residential sector. So I think it is possible. Um, and if I could go back to your last question about uh, what needs to change in rate design. One thing that comes to mind is uh, related to demand response. And uh, the details get uh, in the weeds pretty quickly, but I would just say that as a model, there are a couple ISOs, uh, PGM and uh, Ontario IESO, that have this co-optimized uh, demand response program for emergency, ancillaries, and energy. And I can provide all three, let me bid in all three, and whatever the, I, or whatever the ISO wants, we can co-optimize this, uh, similar to how generators do it. So I think that'd be a nice goal, and we could figure out a way to do it. Um, that'd be great. And, and I, I guess I would urge an open mind about how we integrate these resources. We have special rules for wind. We have special rules for solar. Um, demand response is and should be a preferred resource. It's one of the few, uh, maybe only zero emission dispatchable resources out there. And it provides much needed uh, diversity of, of resource. So when we have this Aliso Canyon situation uh, in, in Southern California, um, you can't rely on a natural gas generator to provide that 
solution for ancillaries or, or emergency demand response or response uh, because there's no natural gas to supply them, right? Uh, batteries are great. They only have so much capacity. So if you have a, an eight hour problem, they can't provide value for the entire eight hours. Uh, transmission lines can go down. So imports can sometimes have problems. So, so there's a lot of tools that uh, the more diverse you are in those resources, the more reliable you're going to be. So one of the interesting challenges here is dealing with this issue of consumers that, uh, and it could be businesses as well, who don't really want to deal with, uh, with wildly varying prices and with all the vagaries of, of becoming a direct uh, participant in grid services. But I come from 30 years of tech startup companies, and I have endless optimism toward the private sector to come through with great solutions like the ones that Susan's company is, is doing now. I mean, if we, if we have much more dynamic pricing without taking that term too literally, but much more variable pricing where energy may be free uh, in the middle of the afternoon in the spring and the fall when there's a lot of excess generation, but then not so free in the middle of the afternoon in the summer. Aren't there companies that are right on the edge of, of, of offering services, whether it's Nest thermostats or Apple's home products or any of these other companies that are out there ready to go to be able to do the kind of management that, that Susan is talking about for commercial customers? Isn't there that opportunity for, for entrepreneurs that California is so famous for to step into the breach and go, hang on just a second, I can help these consumers and, um, and be uh, be a good grid citizen at the same time uh, without killing them on prices, so. Well, if that tech, is this on? Oh, there we go. If, if that technology is out there or is out there some, at some point in the future, I'm certainly all for it. I think, I think for consumers, the important thing is, first of all, you have to get their attention to make sure they know what choices they have. And then we need to have a very intensive education and outreach so that so that people can understand and make those smart choices. Um, but if you're able to use technology to, to help manage some of this, you know, I think that's a good thing because you're you're what's important is keeping things simple and clear and cost effective. And so if all of those factors are present, then perhaps there is a technology out there. But in the meantime, I, you know, in terms of, you, you were talking about dynamic pricing, which is even a further step along, but in terms of the time of use, not all customers are going to be able to respond and adapt in the same way. And so we have to be cognizant of that. We, you know, someone who's at home all day and they, they may not be able to shift shift energy uses in, in a way that someone else may. So we have to keep that in mind. And one of the things that, that I really like about the time of use rates that are going to roll out, the law that's going to roll out in January 2019, is that during that first year, we do have in California the, the one-year rate protection. So if there are people who lose out because they're on time of use, they will have that opportunity to, uh, to, to get out of it. And um, so during that first year, if they're doing time of use and then they don't, you know, they, they lose by doing so, they can opt out and their rates are fully protected. So I think that does allow some opportunity to really see who wins and who loses and then make adjustments accordingly. Well, and there is good data that shows uh, from Arizona, for example, that shows that customers can understand and respond to time of use rates if they're properly educated. Um, and uh, as, Elizabeth, as Elizabeth says, if you make some accommodations for the customers who can't respond, and that's something the c commission can do. I just want to add that um, I think you hit it on the head when you said um, most people don't want to spend more than 10 minutes a, a year looking at this. I think you really have a two-tiered approach. You have large commercial customers who have big energy bills, or who have an interest, a staff that are willing to study these things and take the, take the actions. But the vast majority of special residential customers don't, although some, some may be interested. But I think having two, two tiers, one for those that aren't interested, one, one, one that those that are interested can opt in. But if they're not interested, having it be automatic um, in, in a way that doesn't consume a lot of time, I think that's uh, a hugely important area. So you're going to have some people that are willing to spend the time and some people that aren't. I think we also have to synchronize what we are telling customers to do and what we're telling the utilities to do. 
because we're, we're, we're spending hundreds of millions of dollars a year right now in, uh, encouraging c customers to put in battery storage that pulls load off the grid in the middle of the day when we have an abundance of solar and we're trying to, we, we need them to actually absorb it. And they're charging batteries later in the day when the system peak is occurring. And then we're telling the utilities to go buy re second, you know, resources in order to be able to handle that. And we want cu the same customers that are pulling load off the grid to pay for that infrastructure. So we have to first synchronize what we're telling customers to do and what we're telling the utilities to do. That's a regulatory issue. Um, the technologies exist, what to, but the, the question is how much load can, you know, the best technology is out there to tell a customer to, to remove their load from the grid during, during the middle of the day or when the peak occurs, but they can only turn their HVAC system so much, right? And they can, they can only turn so many things off. And it's a very shallow amount of load that you can, that you can reduce and it's behaviorally uh, associated. So the utilities can't necessarily count on that as a firm and dispatchable resource. So, uh, you know, what we need to do is Identify like our our flagship project is a fleet of 25 building uh, big commercial office buildings that are outfitted with very large amounts of, of storage. And that fleet becomes a 10 megawatt fleet of, of, of hybrid electric buildings that the utility can dispatch. We've now, within, with this project, we have, we have synchronized the, you, the customer's need for maintaining their costs with the utility's need for resources on that grid by giving the utility the dispatch ability on that. And so the customer is now participating as part of the solution because, we get, because they're participating in a grid support project that the utility is identifying when we need you to shift that load from the grid. It, that you've synchronized it. You're going to lose that customer from a traditional demand response program because they can't keep turning off their HVAC system in the middle of the day. So we have to enable, we have to incentivize them to put the technologies in that allow them to shift the load and synchronize it with what the utility needs or you will be at working at cross purposes. Well, I see Tom lurking in the front row, which means we've only got a couple of more minutes left. Um, so any last thoughts from any of you? Everybody uh, give you each 30 seconds chance to, to wrap it up. Uh, start with Mike here. Anything else you'd like to add? Yeah, I'd just like to say that um, I think we really need to look at the, the future. I, I love the way that um, uh, in the water world they talk about say, save it for what you really love. I, I think that considering the value of clean air and, and a clean planet, even if it costs more, um, we should be comfortable uh, thinking about that, even, th even though I think we try to keep everything co cost neutral. I think it's an important enough issue that we ought to really devote the mind share. And if it means more than 10 minutes a year for people to think about it, uh, maybe we ought to find ways to draw people's attention to, to that, the kind of options they should do. It's an important problem. Thanks, Susan. I would say one of the things we haven't really talked about is, is uh, uh, enabling some of these new technologies like, like storage to participate in renewable energy credits, um, uh, offsets that are, that are allowable for carbon reduction. Right now, that's not, a, that's not an attribute that, that creates value for people if they put it in. So you're, that, that's one way you can incentivize this market because there's a lot, everybody wants to participate in carbon reduction, but uh, getting some of these new technologies into that, uh, that matrix would be a very uh, big incentive. Sam? I guess I'd just say uh, we need to continue to improve the, uh, the focus on the customer. And, and from uh, the perspective of what, what's really happening. So let's not get caught up in theoretical models. Let's say, what, what does this really do to a customer with price, with their behavior? What can they really do? And in our particular case or other industrial cases, are we really reducing emissions or are we just moving it out of state? Uh, Steve, one thing we haven't talked much about yet is uh, low and moderate income customers. Um, there are great organizations like Grid Alternatives that are working hard to extend solar to low and moderate income customers. And if we're going to make this clean energy revolution sustainable and we're going to meet our climate goals in the long run, we have to extend the opportunity to participate to everyone from all walks of life. So we have to, and California, frankly, has been a leader in this, uh, starting with the California Solar Initiative back in uh, uh, 10 years ago. And we have to continue that, uh, both here in California, uh, and be a leader for the rest of the nation to do the same thing. All customers have to be able to participate. Yes, well, I, I certainly second that, that all customers need to be able to participate. I, I also want to draw to people's attention that, that customers can benefit in two ways. So first of all, you've got the individual customer who can benefit by 
putting solar on the roof and, and battery storage and, and they can reduce their rates. But then by doing so, that customer also benefits the system as a whole. And by, by shaving those, those heavy costs and by shifting that load to a, a lo off peak. And so for us as advocates, for Office of Ratepayer Advocates, one of the things that, that we really want to look to as, the, as we continue to modernize the grid is the benefits of, of those customers using renewables, using storage, using demand response, and to ensure that the customers are then not having to pay twice for it if, if the utility is asking for a new distribution line in the next rate proceeding. So this is something that we will certainly be looking very closely at so that, that our customers as a whole are not both paying for, for these shifts and also then paying again for the um, as as a for a new distribution line, which doesn't really actually need to be used anymore because the the load is shifting. Um, so that's just one more point I wanted to add in closing that that it's important to look at both the individual savings and individual benefits, but also the benefits to the grid as a whole. So I think the fact that every one of these people brought up yet another point that we hadn't had time to address here is really uh, really points to the fact that this whole entire area of the consumer impact on all of these policy decisions, these technical decisions that all of you make as grid operators, as regulators, as utilities, um, really do impact customers. And that's really where the, 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 the direction um, and the inspiration should come in terms of how you build out the grid, how you build out policies to help support these larger objectives. So, uh, maybe next year we'll have a longer session on consumers, but uh, uh, I want you to join me in thanking this panel and uh, to close out the day here.